We're continuing the iteration chapter. And um, last time we went over a bunch of different cases for for loops and talked a little bit about for loops versus um, functional programming. And so now we're going to get into the map functions. <clears throat> And uh, so there's four loops that are so common that per has the following. They have uh, this set of <clears throat> map functions. And you can see they uh, make lists, logical vectors, integers, double character vectors, and they all uh, pretty much have the same structure. Um, and they also, have a um, very similar structure to the apply functions. And we're going to take a look at that a little later. Um, but they have fewer named arguments. And they use the dot, 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 et cetera thing. Um, <clears throat> each function takes a vector as an input, which is the dot x, and applies a function, which is the dot f, to each piece, and then returns a new vector that's the same length and has the same names as the input. And um, the dots in front of the letters are because they're written in C, right? No. Um, oh. So that is a convention they use to avoid colliding with column names in your data. Oh. Um, because And then they basically say, and then don't make any column names that start with dot. because. <laughs> then you don't have to worry about when you're passing things into um, uh, these functions. At least that's that's my understanding of it. Oh, okay. I, there might be some other explanation, but I think that's what it's for, is just to avoid. That way, if you have a column named x, it doesn't confuse anything in your code. Ooh, that makes sense. And if you have a function that you named f. Right. Okay. Or, yeah, things like that. So it's just to okay. um, get out of the way. Of course, then you know, like you could start colliding with it. It's also, sorry, also to avoid collisions of argument names. Like if you're passing an argument to a function oh, um, and you have an argument that is X in that yeah. function, you don't want to, you need to be able to pass that in the dots. And so it's okay. confusing. Um, okay. So, Thank yes. <laughs> Thank you for that clarification. Um, so, these, uh, the map functions, basically the functions, um, the author says that they are abstractions that can be difficult to wrap your head around. So don't feel bad about falling back on using loops. They're perfectly serviceable. Um, using map functions, however, can make your code easier to read and uh, to write and read. And so this, chunk of code down here, um, if you don't remember from last week, um, we, uh, there was a function that we wrote to um, get the median and the mean of columns in a data frame. And so that code just gets condensed down into this very nice, simple code. And um, you'll notice when you use uh, the map functions that you also get the column headers, the A, B, C, and D. Um, so you don't have to write the equivalent of the call summary function from the previous section. The focus is on the action being performed, i.e. like the mean, the median, and the standard deviation, not the actual loop. And then that's even more apparent when using them in a pipe. Um, and I'm not sure why it's more apparent. Uh, just because the only argument that you can see is the function is, name. OK. Yeah. I didn't think it could be that simple, but <laughs> <laughs> it is. OK. And you see you get the same results with, again, the um, column headings. So the differences between the map set of functions and the call summary that we previously wrote, um, per is implemented in C, so it's faster. Um, it also, again, uses the dot, dot, dots. Um, the dot F can be an integer or character vector or a formula. And map preserves names. 
um, the column names again, the A, B, C, and D, and call summary doesn't. Sorry, what was the dot, dot, dots again? I know it's just more arguments, but does it specifically that, mean anything other than that? Isn't that like the et cetera, like bring along whatever we've previously used? So what that's for here, especially, is uh, if you look at, for example, mean, uh, mean mm -hmm. has a trim argument where you can say, I want to trim off part of the top and the bottom where it has an oh. na.rm argument and you yeah, need to be able okay. to pass those arguments on. And so map has dot, dot, dot so that you can put in any other arguments that the function wants. Right. Um, I remember or, now, thank you. Yeah. And so it's the arguments to pass along and it's arguments where um, map doesn't know what the arguments are gonna be. So that's what the dot, mm -hmm. dot, dot is for. It's like, and, and whatever else you need, <laughs> basically. Got it, okay. So map sounds like it's more flexible than the apply functions because of that. Um, apply should also have dots, right? Yeah, apply also has dots. Oh, um, okay. but the big, the big, big, big difference between map and the apply fam, the map family and the apply family, is, you know, there's only a handful of apply functions, but they all have like different arguments in different order. Um, what they return can be really confusing. And then map is just straightforward and it's always the same. Okay, there are shortcuts you can use with dot F. Um, the code below splits up the empty cars database into three pieces, one for each value of cylinder and fits the same linear model to each piece. Um, and so I was trying to figure out what this was doing um, and the tilde is used to separate the left and right hand sides in a model formula. And this is something we'll go over in the model chapter. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and um, I was unclear on what the dot X and the dot F is in this case. Um, and is there, should there be a comma between those? <laughs> what's, what's happening? All right. So let's uh, start with empty cars goes into this split function. And that's just splitting the data by the cylinder value. Yes. Okay, so so run just that, just empty cars into the split. Um, and can I do that with- Just select it and control enter. Oh. Okay. Ah. Ah, I think it should work. Okay. Um, without, well, Okay, and now run models uh, or, or print models over in your console on the right. I just want to oh. real quick see that it is three. Confirm that and scroll up, and then we should see that it's three data it's frames. Everybody's faces here. Oh, sorry. Okay, that's okay. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. Or it's sorry, it's eight. Where did it say three? I thought I read three. Yes. Um, um, here, each here value of cylinder is said, I think it's three though. Um, oops. Okay. I mean, I think it's, yeah. Um, so there's a four cylinder, a six cylinder, and an eight cylinder. Yes. So it's three. Oh, oh, never mind. <laughs> it was their names are six, four, and eight. Yes. And so I, th I saw the eight and thought that there were eight, but that's just <laughs> the third one. <laughs> which is named eight, sorry. Um, That's okay. <laughs> so it splits it, so okay, yes. So it splits it into those three groups. And so your dot X is that list of three data frames. Does that make sense? So the, the first argument that you're sending into map is a list that has three different data frames in it. Oh, uh, so. Because it's what comes out of the split. Huh, okay. I don't quite understand that. I think it's something I need to think about to wrap my head around. Um, just go to over in your console, type length of models, length parentheses models. Because the thing that we just created, you know, like we just talked about, it is a length three. Yes. And it's a list. Um, that you know models right now is a list 
So it's a list that has three elements. So that's dot X, that, that list, which means map is going to call whatever function you gave it three times, once for each of those data frames. Is that making so sense? Basically the dot X is what is passed into the function and it's not yes. like written out. Because when you use the pipe, because the it's... first argument is whatever came in from the step before. Okay. Okay. John, so another. The... Oh, go oh, ahead. Forgive me. Sorry. I was going to say the dot notation is a placeholder for the iteration itself. So it's like as the function is processing, you know, recursively going through and through and through over and over again, that dot X is whatever the function pulls in and puts in that in that placeholder for that single time of processing, correct? Uh, not, not in this context. Okay. So for now, just think of it because dot X is the argument name, but then you're kind of referring to what we're going to see in a minute when we do the tilde notation. Okay. Um, formula notation, but so, okay. So we've got, we're, we're passing in whatever came in is dot X. So that means everything that's inside of this map call is dot F. It's the function that we're going to use. Oh, okay. And he's doing a simple one line definition of a function. And actually the fact that this is confusing is useful to prove his point of why there's the formula notation <laughs> because this notation, it's, it's like, what is, oh, this whole thing is just a function. Like he's creating a function on the fly inside of the call to oh, map. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> wow. And, yeah, and that, like that's a pretty common thing to do when you're using map is you just make a throwaway function basically it's just it's okay. um what do they call it it's an an anonymous function because it never gets a name yes. um but you're just creating the function here and that's why there is the cre convenient shorthand that he has in the next block because instead of saying function df and then the function just put a tilde which means which is telling map this thing is a function yeah. And you can just, um, let's see. Uh, yes. And then the data and should be dot. Hold on a sec. <laughs> Go ahead and continue with where you were. And I want to make sure that my brain isn't breaking. Yeah. So it should be dot X, not dot there i think and now i'm wondering why. um he says in the text that it's an adverb and it refers to the current list element there's a pronoun or a pronoun one of, the, Did, one of those. i'll bet it works but i'll bet but i think they changed the um like preferred way to do it since the book came out yeah that oh would okay Right, and if I did dot x, that would work just as well. And yeah, that's interesting. Um, okay, so that should be dot x. Yes, I would use dot x there. Um, oh, okay. The reason is then when we get to map two, it's consistent because you have two things to refer to, dot x and dot y. Okay. And using just dot is vague. So okay. um, it's interesting that both work. I didn't know that both could work in the formula syntax for map. Um, so uh, uh, Federica has a question. Uh, uh, oh, we have, so. Uh, Lucy has a question that yes, we will. We are producing three models in this case um, because it's running it three times through this LM function, which produces a model. And then Federica was asking if you can specify um, dot f just before then the you you can do it dot f equals the function. The function. Um, you can't do dot f. Uh, equals LM because you need to uh, like put your thing into LM in a specific position, which is what, what the function or the formula notation is for. 
It's so that you can say, okay, I want to call LM with this M, uh, MPEG by weight argument and then data equals dot X. And it's just a way of putting your data, your incoming data into the function. So you can simulate what you would write at the console. Is that, is everyone following? So now I want to like read help and see if they ever use dot anymore. And I don't, I think they switched fully to dot X, which is interesting that he didn't update the book just for that one little bit. Yeah, actually, yes, they have almost ex this exact um, set of uh, examples are now in the help from map. So, um, yeah. <laughs> okay, so sorry. In Federica's example, then it's you are doing empty cars and then um, giving the split as a function to map first and then passing that output into LM or. No, you're still just splitting outside of map and then just um, here, let me rewrite the thing that I just pasted to, to show it without the shorthand. So basically you can just specify that the, the thing that is in map is the .f because that's what it will do automatically. It's just to make it a little clearer that that's what's going on. Um, but you can't do, uh, let me see, just simply um, you know, let's say like that without the tilde. So yeah, um, at least they need to, to add the tilde. Yeah, yeah, you you need to have the tilde there to tell it um, I'm writing out the full call to the function. I'm not just providing a function, I'm providing the full this is how you're going to use the function. Got it. Got it. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, and with my favorite thing there. So normally I, I think of the tilde as like by. Um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, but it's more of a like maybe through, like map through LM with these arguments, um, uh -huh. or map by calling LM with these arguments. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, mm -hmm. okay. By calling, I like. I think I like by calling because that way it's the same as the other bys that I use. So, um, but it, it's it's a map. It, I guess that is the word. But you're creating a map of what to do in each loop through the map. You're, you're drawing out uh, the arguments. Oh, okay. That makes sense for the name then. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Are we good on that? <clears throat> okay. <laughs> yeah. uh, so uh, per provides a convenient shortcut for creating an anonymous function, a one-sided formula. And so this is the same thing, just without the uh, <clears throat> spelling out the function. Oh, and then um, you can use, you can further condense that down um, just by uh, calling the name or a string. So we can go from this big long thing that was very confusing <laughs> to me down to just R squared. Well, to be clear, the, the R squared thing is a, it's different, a different function. Yeah, yeah, yes. right. And that's when you just want to extract some named thing from uh, from the result. Yes, from, uh, as I have. Each, each one of the results. Yeah, yeah. Map semi. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so you can also use an integers to select elements by position. And uh, <clears throat> so 
So in base R, we have the apply family of functions and they have similar similarities to per, which we said um, before, but these have extra arguments and um, <clears throat> the author focuses on per because they have more consistent names and arguments and helpful shortcuts. And in the future, we'll provide easily easy parallelism and progress bars, which I, <laughs> I did That's not understand. Funny. So uh, that I again, might understand the parallelism, but progress um, bars. It's really, it's funny. Like um, I've been watching the, the tidy modeling with our book that we've done a book a few book clubs for is wrapping up right now to go into production and i promise this story is going to make sense here they had a whole conversation about a thing that they wanted they had in the book about things they want to do in tidy models eventually and they were like oh god we've got to take out that whole section for the print version of the book because it'll look ridiculous in six months when we decide we don't want to do that and then forever it's in the book saying we want to do that he never did the parallelism stuff in per because someone made a separate package called fur f-u-r-r which does the parallelism and the progress bar stuff and that's for if you need to run you know a ton of things that can be split into you know like if you think about the way map works um it's calling that function you know from what we saw it was three times or it but it could be like a billion times you call this function, do this thing. The idea of parallelism, that's where you split it over different processes and do them all at the same time. And if you're calling it a billion times, probably you can just call it, you know, um, a third of a billion times on each of three processors. And it would work exactly the same way, just be way faster. And especially if you have more processors to split it over. So that's what that package fur is all about, is doing the splitting. Um, it, it uses, there's a package called futures, which does, which is all about doing parallelism because it's saying do a thing and then give me the result in the future. So it's called futures. So fur is futures plus per. Um, the important part of all of that is that thing. And one more R, F-U-R-R-R, -R -R, oh, just gosh, like per. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, yeah, it does all the parallelism. parallelism. It's not, that never was nor never will be in per. <laughs> okay. Um, probably not coincidentally, the guy that wrote fur now works for our studio um, because he did something that Hadley never got around to doing, basically. So <laughs> I think uh, that's a really good way to get a job. Yeah. <laughs> Here, I, I solved hope. this problem for you. <laughs> Making sure that, yes, yeah, that's uh, Davis Vaughn. So. <clears throat> Okay, right. so uh, edl apply is basically identical to map, so it creates a list, but again, map the map functions are more consistent. Base s apply is a wrapper around l apply that automatically simplifies the output. Um, I wasn't sure what wrapper meant. Um, let me see if I can pull something up real quick. Oops. So, um, if you, if you just go to your console and type S apply mm. and, um, enter without get, get rid of the arguments, just, just the function itself, the name of the function, no, no parentheses. There you go, enter. You can see that it is a function that calls L apply. It's answer gets L apply, blah, blah, blah. And then it does some stuff with the thing that L apply returns. So that's what it means to say it's a wrapper is it calls L apply for you and then it does some things. Oh, that's a neat trick, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, that is something nice about R is for most functions, okay. at least, you can um, just type in their name and run it in the console and see what they do. Okay. Um, you can also, by the way, hit F2 when you're on the name of a function, and that'll load it in our studio in a nice window where you can see like the formatted code. Um, but yeah, so the, the basic idea is S apply 
uh, is like apply or it not just like apply, it is L apply, like it calls L apply, and then it does some stuff to simplify your answer. Um, but like he talks about, that can be dangerous if you're doing it in, in a function because you're expecting to get back a list and it's like, oh, this list happens to be a character vector. So I'm going to return it as a character vector instead. And you're like, wait, what? I, I thought I was getting a list. So okay. um, yeah, so. first, and that's why the, the explicit like map underscore CHR, map underscore DBL, those are, you know what you're getting list or getting okay. back and they'll throw an error if you don't get that back. Um, which again, when you're programming with it, it's better to get an error than for it to just kind of say, well, it, you know, close enough. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, I know you wanted a character, but or, or I know you wanted an, an integer, but I got the letter A. Eh, that's fine, right? Yeah. Like, <laughs> no. <laughs> so. Okay. So that's why the author says it's useful when interactive, but unpredictable in a function. Yeah. Okay. And um, so V apply is a safe alternative to S apply because you supply an additional argument that defines the type. <clears throat> so this is an example of that um, being equivalent to the map. <clears throat> map Sorry, the map LGL. function is logical. Not logical. Yeah, so it's saying, so V apply that last argument, the logical one is saying, the result I get back should be a logical, um, a logical value versus map, map LGL, map logical, you're saying only like fail if you don't give me a, a logical value back. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so it's less, or the map function is less typing but V apply can make a matrix and maps only ever produce vertices. That should be vectors, but. Vectors? Yeah. That would make a lot more sense. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I took typing and sometimes my hands just type other words that <laughs> are in the same pattern. <laughs> um, so dealing with failure, which um, <laughs> is such a great chapter title. Um, when you use the map functions to repeat many operations, the chances are much higher that one of those operations will fail. So there is a function called safely, which is designed to work with map. Mm -hmm. And um, so we have uh, results here. There's results and error. Did you have a question, Federica? Oh, sorry. Um, um, <laughs> uh, that, that was <laughs> <laughs> totally <That's> okay. okay. <laughs> totally. Federica's thinking out loud. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that, that's fine. <laughs> um, so result is the original result. And if there was an error, this would be null. Um, so we can see when we tried to um <clears throat> do this with a character the result is null and it let us know that which is nice and then um possibly oh okay okay so that's safely and gave us a lot of results <laughs> and um let us know <clears throat> where there were things uh, missing. So possibly um, is another function. You give it a default value to return when there's an error. So we have our little NA here, which is helpful. And then quietly, instead of capturing errors, it captures printed output messages and warnings. Um, I, uh, I was thinking those are very interesting functions. I, I didn't know about those ones. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I love these functions uh, when I do a lot of programming that if I've got some big, you know, big list of things that I want to 
um, I'm trying to think of a, well, let's say you want to take the log of um, some value and it should, the input should always be, um, or, or I don't, you know, the input should always be numbers, but in some cases, maybe it'll be a letter or um, it'll be, let's say, uh, well, it'll be negative one could be one of the values. And that's going to give you a warning when you call log. And, uh, you know, I don't want my, my console to get full of all these warnings that are coming in for processing a billion rows or whatever. So you can run it through safe or through quietly and just like save all of those warnings into another column or something like that and deal with them more systematically. Um, possibly is, is really great that let's say you have something where you're hitting some web page to get some piece of data um, periodically and you're like building something up with that you don't want you probably don't want whatever your process is to just stop when uh, that web page is updating or something instead you have it just put a value in for whatever it is that is the error like you know you could, let's say that you're reading some piece of data and you could just instead of putting the piece of data that you're reading you could say web page unavailable or something like that in your data frame and that's what possibly lets you do. Instead of it hitting the error and just dying, it's going to hit the error and go, oh, I know what to do when I hit an error. I can put in an NA or I can put in a certain message or whatever. Um. <laughs> I, I, want, I wanted to, to add something. Uh, today I found an, a function call, uh, I'm, I read in the chat, Coalesh. Coalesce. In oh, coalesce. Coalesce. Co uh, yes. Yeah. That was very interesting. So you, <laughs> when you merge two, two data sets and you found that you have two separate columns that are of the same, um, so you merge the two data set within <laughs> more than one column. And so the, the new data you want to be merged within the other two of the, Two columns. Let's say that you are merging a, a map data, spatial data, and you have like the regions, latitude, the longitude. When and you miss some 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 stay some some regions, and so you take this this uh, region from another data set and you join them you now with a join function. What happens is that the new data doesn't merge within the latitude and longitude columns. So it creates new, two new columns, two new latitude and longitude. And if you use this coalesce uh, function, he merges uh, the, the latitude and the longitude or the columns that you want to be merged uh, in a way that uh, you, you have the new data inside your data frame. It's very interesting. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> Sounds really useful. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so we can map. Oops, sorry, I was muted. I wanted to oh, say, sorry. just I want to say, yes, I agree. Coalesce is great. And that the problem with this book is it's a great introduction to the tidyverse. But we actually, um, like when we did the advanced art group, there's a package that 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 book is basically about called Arlang. And we were saying that we should just do a, another book club that is just the help docs of Arlang and read every help doc because there's so much in that package. And I could I could do the same thing for dplyr or per or tidyr that there, there are so many functions that we're not going to get to that uh, uh, still every once in a while someone will do something in per and I read their code and I'm like, wait, what? Oh my God, I've written that function like a dozen times and it's just sitting there in per ready to go. So um, yes, coalesce is an example of a function from dplyr where once you find it, you're like, oh, I've, I've worked so hard to make that work before and it just does it. So, <laughs> all right, I'll let you continue. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Is anybody else muted that has something to say? <laughs> <laughs> All right, I think we're good. 
good. Um, so mapping over multiple arguments, uh, map to and pmap functions are for multiple related inputs that you need to iterate along in parallel. So simulating random normals with different means with map. So we've got a mu. And then um, what if you also want to vary the standard deviation? One way to do that would be to iterate over the indices and index into vectors of means and standard deviations. Um, but instead, we could use map2 to make it simpler and clearer. So we have this code here that does uh, the same thing. That they're random, that's right. OK, um, so this is what it looks like in graphical form. So we have our um, list that we started with, and this is how they get combined and how they run in parallel. OK, so OK, map. Like map, map two is just a wrapper around a for loop. OK, so now I know what that means. <laughs> so um, map, instead of having like map three, map four, et cetera, um, per has pmap, which can take a list of arguments. It's better to name the arguments. Uh, pmap does use positional calling, but it's fragile. And um, in this case, since the arguments are the same length, it makes sense to store them in a data frame like so. Okay. Becky, I have a, a question. So, I, or I guess not a question, but an observation. So, um, if you scroll up to, oh, I don't have it in line. Um, keep going, please. Mm -hmm. Uh, one more, keep going. Okay, there we go. So there the call is, you know, map tilde r norm, and then um, I guess it's the number of samples to put it that way, and then mu dot x sigma. So the output there is one, two, three, four, five. And that is the mean standard deviation, mean standard deviation, mean standard deviation. Is that correct? All in one list? for that particular combination of mean and standard deviation? This one right here mm -hmm. um, is just, oh, wait a minute, sigma. I am not sure. That's how I thought based on the explanation, yeah. but then it's very confusing to have both things as one list and an output. But you know, I, that might be a, a different issue altogether. I guess you could then split those things. I don't know. Don, do you have a... <laughs> I'm so a sorry, I was looking at something was else. Thinking. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sorry, can you, can you repeat what the question is? Well, let's say, yeah, here, so the list, Right, it gives a list of three and five, five outputs for each list. So since the call uh, to map is map tilde r norms, you're getting five, you know, samples, but it's iterating over or changing, you know, a con the combination of mean standard deviation each time. And so here in the output is this 5.57, the mean, and then 5.69, the standard deviation. Uh, so it should be doing yes. Um, so if we look at the order of arguments in our norm is uh, n mean standard deviation, right? So um, yeah, it's going to take five. It's it's producing five things with a mean of um, the first element of mu, which is five, and a standard deviation of the first element of sigma, which uh, is whatever the first element of sigma, oh, it's one. And then the second time it's going to, um, element number two, 
so that the the important thing to see here is uh, mm -hmm. sec along, you know, sequence along move mm -hmm. is just going to do a sequence um, one, two, three. Yeah, I get and, that. And so, yeah, map is getting as its argument one, then two, then three. Mm -hmm. And so then in each of these calls, we're just saying, I want the first element from each of those. And then I want the second element from each of those. And then I want the third element from each of those. Did that make sense? Huh, okay. Maybe I just need to understand better what our norms actually does. <laughs> so, okay. So it, it makes a random normal distribution with length with a specified of, uh okay okay yeah the, my my mistake i'm sorry okay, yeah. okay it's not actually printing out the the mean and standard deviation it's generating right, right. it's using okay. them to generate random numbers yeah yeah yeah, yeah. okay sorry about that <laughs> no problem. thank you that was helpful thank you well and so it's good to make sure that we understand that basic version, because then the map version doesn't make any sense. It, like that, ver you know, map two is just do that same thing, but make it clearer. And so if it wasn't clear to begin with, it's probably still going to be fu fuzzy when you get into the map two version. So. Um, <clears throat> so we can invoke different functions or even more complexity, you can vary the function itself. And um, oh, to handle this case, you can use invoke map. And so something just before we dive too deep into these, um, these functions are what the life cycle is listed as retired in the package. Oh, OK. Um, Should I just comment out of this entire section? <laughs> um, like. Uh, where where do they say they they like in I, what I would recommend is for these read the help in per because it says instead of using these functions do these things, um, and honestly I I never knew these functions existed. I don't think I've ever needed to do this. Um, this is really you're doing some really weird complex stuff if when you need this. So, okay. um, yeah, there's. A function called exec, which is actually just re-exported from the Arlang package. And if you need to do this stuff, read advanced R. Because <laughs> this is where the complicated things come in. Okay, so it's it's the run if R norm and R, I guess Poisson yes. functions that are no longer in use. No, no, those are in use. The oh, okay. in, invoke this invoke map function. Oh, okay. Thank you. They've retired <laughs> that. Um, there and so I mean, you can basically. I think you can do exactly this just by changing invoke map to exec. Um, but it's not. It doesn't work the way that. Like I can't say for sure that it works the way it shows in this chapter, and okay. they retired it because it wasn't useful. So let's. See, I, I mean, see. let's see. Okay. Let's see what happens. Okay. Sorry about that. Yeah, it wasn't. Uh, nope. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> I spelled it right, right? Yeah, I think okay. you have to. Um, I, I, I think you actually need three exclamation points before param or wait before F. So right there and then in, or not not in invoke map, but with exec specifically. Yeah, I'm, uh, yeah. Try to do that. Let's see if that oh. does it. Oop. And then, yeah, never mind. Um, okay. So, shall we move on? <laughs> I, th I think so. I, I mean, if you need to do this, the help for invoke map kind of walks through the translation from the book to the new way of doing things. Um, but, life cycle. Okay. Yeah. Um, it is down in the life cycle section. Um, they're retired in favor of exec. They are no longer under active development, but we will maintain them in the package indefinitely. Un it says indefinitely, but he meant indefinitely. <laughs> um, and sorry, invoke map actually is retired without replacement. That's the thing. Um, and that's what it is. He says, hey, just like 
if you need to use this, use map or map two and other um, these other functions that let you vary the function. Um, I don't know for sure that it's easier to understand the new way because you have to get into things like the triple exclamation point of what the heck does that mean? Um, so um, I don't know, like I would skip it because again, I didn't even know this function existed, let alone had been retired. Um, it's not something I've ever needed to do. If I need to do three functions, I do three calls, you know, like I, I don't, I can't think of a case where I've needed to iterate through functions like that. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so moving on to walk. <laughs> All right. Um, walk is an alternative to map that you can use when you want to call a function for its side effects rather than for its return value. Say you want to output or render output to the screen or save files to disk. Um, the important thing is the action not the return value. Okay, so, um, oh, okay, never mind. <laughs> walk has walk to and p walk, like the map function does, and they are more useful than walk. You can also use them in the middle of pipelines since they invisibly return dot x. An example of using p walk to save each file to a corresponding location on disk, like say a list of plots with vectors, with vector of file names like this, um, you can use something like this code. <laughs> okay, so other patterns of for loops. Um, per provides a number of other functions that abstract over other types of for loops. This is a brief intro. And um, hopefully we can do this in 10 minutes. <laughs> um, uh, predicate functions, they return true or false. Um, so keep and discard are um, examples. It keeps elements that are true and discards elements that are false. So. Right. Do you, does it make sense what it's doing there? Um, I think it it did when I first went over it. <laughs> now I'm like, what was happening again? Um, keep is factor discard. Is um, no, it's not making sense. <laughs> All right, so let's see. Let's look at Iris. Oh, yeah, Iris. Um, hold on a sec. Let me. Make sure that I understand it before I tell you how it's <laughs> <Okay>. working. <laughs> um, yeah. All right. So, oh, okay. Part of what I, the thing that was confusing me is that it's this is two separate outputs. Um, and so, if we just look at the first one, iris keep is factor, and then the structure of that, that is that right there. It yes. only keeps the column that is a factor. So, you're saying keep it if it is a factor. Oh, okay. And then the second one is discard it if it's a factor. And so it only keeps, or it gets rid of that one column that is a factor. Okay. Um, I, I mean, I can definitely imagine um, a case where you only want to keep the numeric columns from some giant data frame. And it's a pain to go through and figure out, you know, the names of every column you want to keep or something like that. And so you just say keep is integer or keep is numeric, something like that. Um, that. These are, this is in that type of functions where like, I had no idea these were in uh, per, uh, and, and the same, some and every I relatively recently learned about have like, uh, it was one of the, I think it was some that I had written uh, like a million times. <laughs> It's like I've done the long notation of this same thing. So yes, and so we have sum in every. Yeah. Um, determine if true for any sum or all every. So we have a list. Um, so 
are some of them characters, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and is every, <clears throat> excuse me, is everything a character? Yes. Um, so there's also detect and detect in index. Detect finds the first element where true and detect index returns the position. So um, we have, uh, it found uh, the first element where that was true and then the position. And head while and tail while, while true, take elements from the start, which is obviously head while or the end, which is tail while. Then we have reduce and accumulate. Um, sometimes you have a complex list that you want to reduce to a simple list by repeatedly applying a function that reduces a pair down to one pair. And I was curious where, like, why would you want to do this? <laughs> Reduce, um, reduce is, uh, let's see. So I want to see the example that he's doing. Yeah, so it's, you take, so you take, uh, when you do the reduce full join, you're saying, I want to do a full join of this age tibble to the sex tibble. And then I want to do a full join of the result of that to the treatment table, the TRT table. And so it's saying, I want to keep doing this thing to the result of the previous iteration. That's what reduce is, is every time something comes out, put it into the function with the next argument. Um, I, I guess I was thinking from, because I'm still very new to like <laughs> looking at data sets, like why, like you have to, you would have to be careful that, with this, right? Um, let's, let's think of, um, Let's say, uh, I'm trying to think of a, a realistic example, but if you have like some sort of, um, you want to, you need to compare two things and decide which one wins and then compare wow. that to the next thing and then compare that to the next thing. Oh, okay. So okay. whichever one, like, that's a really simplistic example because a lot of times yeah. it would be just take the max or something like that. But there are cases where, I've definitely used this where you, um, you know, you, you do a thing and then take that thing and compare it to the next thing or do something with the next thing, like combine it with the next thing in okay. some way. Don, um, what about, what about like phone book addresses? So you've got a, a data set of usernames, addresses, and I don't know, phone numbers, we'll say, and you want, you also have a list of zip codes for that particular geographic area. You could use the reduce function to take that address, compare it to a zip code, and then return, yes, that is within that, that uh, particular zip code or no, it's not, iterate to the next address. Would that work? No, that wouldn't no. be reduced because you don't okay. care about the previous output. So reduce is specifically when you want to, you produce an output and then you want to use that output as an argument to the next call of the function. Um, a lot of times if you're doing some sort of like text combination, reduce can work. Um, mm -hmm. I, I have a, a reduce use case where I'm like trying, it, it's, um, basically trying to find a path uh, through a database from one field to another field. And it's checking okay. some comparisons over and over. Um, okay. So reduce is for that. Um. <laughs> OK. OK, so the um, Sorry, one, one last question. And is this only for joins, or is it? No, no, no. For... Any okay. function, yeah. Okay. Got it, thank you. So we have another example down here where it reduces it down to the common, yeah, the intersection or the common elements to each list, right? Which is one, three, and 10. Okay, and uh, accumulate keeps all the interim results. You can use it to 
implement a cumulative sum. And there we go. So does anyone have any other questions? I had a question on a previous section, but if sure. someone has a question, go ahead. Which section did you have a question on? So on the section um, where it says walk, walk to, and P walk all invisibly return, quote, period, quote, what was that period? It's uh, the input. Whatever the it goes, input. Okay. the first argument, I guess, you know, the thing coming into walk. So if you're in a pipe, like um, okay. if after walking print, you wanted to, I don't know, paste. So let, let go ahead uh, in that code after walk print, put another pipe. And then print, or sorry, not print, paste, paste. And that's it. And run that. And that should work. <laughs> ah. <laughs> and then get so lost. <laughs> All right. Okay, let's try this now. So, uh, why does it have one tenth set? Did you run the full block or just the walk? Maybe X. There we go. Yeah. Like, what is happening? Yeah, walk or okay. X had a different definition. Yeah. So. <laughs> So when it hits the walk, it does the print of each of them, and then mm -hmm. it continues on. The paste didn't really seem to, there didn't really do much of anything interesting there. Mm -hmm. um, if we did, uh, actually, if we do paste uh, collapse equals space. Um, oh. No, sorry, uh, quote, like quote, quote, space, okay. quote, yeah. <laughs> And then run it again. Okay. All right. So that did what I was aiming to do. Of so it, it does the walk and then it gets to the paste and it does whatever it takes that original X as the input into the paste and does paste. So it's as if walk never happened. The reason that's useful is you can imagine, well, number one, I can definitely imagine cases where I just want to know what's going in. And so I tell it to you know do something like print. Um, you can do things like uh, generate a plot. So walk over this data and generate plots because I want to see those as you're going, but then continue through my pipeline and do whatever the next step is. Again, I don't know that I ever actually do this because if I'm working interactively, I just run the walk and then separately run the, you know, whatever step I want to do afterwards. Mm -hmm. But in theory, um, I could definitely see, I, I could imagine saving off results through a walk just in the middle of a pipeline. It's like, okay, when you get to this step, save those results to disk, but then keep going through the rest of the pipeline and do this other thing. Um, I'll bet there is code I could simplify that way, actually, by using walk that way. Um, okay. And so, yeah, that's all it is, is that it, the return value from walk, since it's doing a side effect, it's doing something that doesn't have any meaningful return value, like generating a plot, you know, pr uh, displaying a plot or saving something to disk or, you know, um, writing something to a web page something somewhere. It's the kind of thing where the return value would just be true or success mm -hmm. or something like that. Instead of that, it returns whatever came into the function. So the X that you started with and you can continue through your, your pipe. Got it. Okay, thank you. That's very helpful. You're welcome. Um, for the the reduce and accumulate thing, um, he he also talks about those in uh, advanced R, and it was like a running joke almost that in the club, um, no, like people were kept trying to find a use for reduce where they would say, oh, you could use reduce here. Well, no, it'd be easier to just blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and like over and over that came up. It was like, oh, we could use, well, we could use reduce, but that would be overcomplicated. I I stand by that there are times when it is extraordinarily useful that 
Um, but I can't think of a, a great example right now, but it's where you take the output and then you use that as your first argument. Um, if you wanna know, you know, what's the highest value I have seen so far in this data it, through, through a full output of some process that I do, um, I take the input and then I wanna to compare to that. So I wanna to compare to whatever the old highest was and keep only the best one. That's part of what why it's reduced is it's like I have this big list of of contenders and I just want one back. I want to know the best one, whatever best means in this case. And so it has to tell me, well, what was the result when I ran that previous one through whatever I'm doing? You know, give me back that result of, you know, best, mm -hmm. for example. Um that's one example of when it comes out so it's like what am i comparing to if i have some big process that i have to do just give me back the whatever um i think probably if you were trying to do like some sort of hotter colder type of thing knowing you know you need to know what the previous result was so that you can say whether this result is higher or lower or hotter or colder or whatever and so something there could be something um, that's a really good example. <laughs> I, Remember, but Remember, yeah, it's it's one of those. Um, I could see that being a use case, um, but it's hard to translate that to an actual, like, real use case other than playing a game with kids, you know. <laughs> um, but there are there definitely are cases. I, I use it every once in a while. And usually when I use it, it, I have struggled to do something. And I'm like, this isn't working. Why is it? Oh, this is a reduce problem. I should use reduce here. And then it's easy. So oh. <laughs> it's one of those that you want to know it exists so that you can have that. Oh, right. OK. Um, and then accumulates the same thing, except you're keeping each result. But then you compare, you know, like they said, um, like a cumulative sum is the key example of accumulate that you take whatever the value, the, you know, the sum was from the last step and then add the new value. And then at each step it's returning um, what that, that sum is so far. So it's, it's returning the total at that moment. Um, right, 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 right. Okay. I was thinking maybe like, um, could you use it? And this might be just out there, but like with logicals in a decision tree or something like that? if you were just wanting to keep a specific path through a tree? Um, almost certainly, because that's really close to what I, the example I can think of that I've used it yeah, for. Yeah, so, yeah. Okay. Um, I, like, and if I sat down and worked through a problem, um, it's like, it's one of those where it's good to know it exists so that you can go read the help and go, okay, would this help me solve what I'm trying to do? no okay then i'll move on to something else but knowing that it's there to maybe be helpful um and it's when you're trying to combine everything into some single value and you're not just trying to take the mean or the median or something like that but you're trying to do some sort of like pairwise comparison um something like that okay okay <laughs> Okay, anything else? All right, so next week we have, um, I was just looking at this. I think we're getting into modeling, right? Um, yes, and so Federica is going to take us through the, um, the intro chapter 22, uh, chapter 22 and starting into 23. I assume we won't make it through all of that because the concept of modeling is a pretty big concept. Um, but we'll see. So something to be aware of when we're working through this, like this is long before the tidy modeling framework existed. And um, they have changed their minds about a lot of things. But the concept of modeling from these chapters, I think it's still going to be very useful. Just probably don't actually implement things the way it shows here and that's where there's a whole other book for that um if you're i mean getting up and running this it's not there's nothing broken with this code but if you're going to do any like really hardcore um Im really important modeling that there's a whole other book to walk you through how to do that so, all right 
I will see everyone next week. Thanks so much, Vicky. Thank you. Thank you, Vicky.